I greet you in the name of God, the creator, the author, the finisher of our faith. I greet you in the revelation of God, who escapes all the boxes and the labels that we trap her in and reveals herself in special places, such as the baccalaureate last night where she appeared. Many languages, many names, many cultures, and many tongues. I greet you, and I thank President Copenhaver for this opportunity to address the 2015 graduation class. I acknowledge all of those who have gathered in this place. President Copenhaver, Dean Sarah Drummond, faculty, administrators, staff, trustees, family, friends, and especially you, the graduates. And so I say to God, after Sister Inez have proclaimed the word as powerfully and clearly as she has, here I am, God, find a little place to use me. Graduations are always historic. They represent rites of passage. There's an eagerness of expectation as past and present and future all converge on a place. It's a time of beginnings. And so as I stand here, I remember the year 1963 when I stood in this same church with my mother and my father and my brother and my sisters, including my sister Myra, who is back here with me after 50 years here today, I remember that moment when I heard my name called, when I moved to receive a diploma and an embrace from then President Herbert Gazork, which represented for me a stamp of approval that I was worthy to go forward. And empowered by the classes I had taken, the faculty who had touched my mind and my spirit, the fieldwork experience of Blue Hill Ministry, and a new family of relationships, both students and faculty, I began what has now been more than a 50-year journey. In the year 1963, I stepped from my graduation ceremony directly into a world that was a place of hopes and dreams for some, but to others it was a place of walls and nightmares. It was a place of welcome and inclusivity for some, but for others it was a place of alienation and estrangement. It was a time of spiritual rebirth and renewal for some, but for others it felt as if the moral heart and soul of the nation had unraveled. So in 1963, I took my diploma and my stamp of approval directly into the streets of Washington, D.C., joining 200,000 black and white brothers and sisters, listening to a prophet by the name of Martin Luther King, Jr., who took on nightmares with a dream that would revolutionize and transform America's values. I left the streets that same year and answered the call to serve as Minister of Christian Education of First Congregational United Church of Christ in Atlanta, Georgia. Joined its ministerial team, first task to minister to the heart, minds, and souls of a congregation that was grieving the loss of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy and to answer the question, why is there evil and injustice in the world? In a few minutes, you two will step across this stage, receive your diploma, affirming that you two are worthy. However much has changed over the past 50 years, you are entering another world where boundaries are shifting and language is changing and new alliances are forming. You're entering a world where tradition and theology and race and class and cultures and disciplines are forming new patterns of insight into the world. And yet, 
with all the changes that have occurred in the world and even in the seminary on the hill, there are still nuggets of truth that I'm calling rocks that I believe can inform and inspire your journey. The rocks I'm referring to are those which are at the core of your existence, that which frames the foundation for your dreams, your hopes, that which grips you and holds your spirit and simply will not let it go. So I raise a question. When you step across the stage, reach for your diploma, who or what informs who you are in ways that you are not free to walk away from? What will have binding authority for you? It's a question about your identity, your calling. It's a question about what you will say yes to, what you say no to. It's a question of what you are prepared to live with and what you refuse to live with. It's a question of whose rules and visions will resonate with you. It's the question of not just what you know, but it is the question of your character and your integrity in a time when seductions are real and compromises seem to come all too frequent. I raise the question for your discernment and for mine. I raise them because I've wrestled with these questions for many, many years, and they are carved out of me, my testimony, a 50-year activist who has tried to remain centered and focused in a world of the powers and the principalities while living in the midst of many communities of resistance and hope. First word to you, I've always believed that I had to have clarity about my identity and purpose in life. There's an African proverb that says, it doesn't really matter what they call you, it's what you answer to that matters. In 1961, I made a choice to board a Greyhound bus to leave the segregated South with all the signs and symbols and the many names that I had been called that defined me as an object and not a subject, and to head north to a rock on a hill, to head north to the oldest existent seminary in the nation. I was answering another call that would define my life and my journey as the wheels of the bus took me further and further from home, from my safety net, from all that I thought to be true, the fear of the unknown began to well up in me, and I began to experience doubts about the choices that I had made. Why had I ever allowed Purcell Austin, my mentor, a 1954 graduate from Andover Newton, talk me into applying, and what if I failed? And then a rock spoke to me. It was the rock that gave birth to me. It was my mother, Cora Elizabeth Chambers. This rock was my spirit guide, my prayer warrior, my inspiration, her words to me as she put me on that bus. Never forget who you are. You have been created in the image of God. You belong to God. She said that the grace of God would never take me to a place where that the will of God would never take me to a place where the grace of God would not find a way to keep me. She always said that the God of justice and hope goes already before us to lead us, to prepare a place for us, and it was up to me to seize the moment, to open my mind, my heart, my spirit, and embrace what God had in store. Her words reminded me, you're not traveling alone, but in the company of many who have gone before you. And throughout my sojourn on the hill, I was clear that I was anchored in a family, a faith, and a community. And guess what? They knew my name. <laughs> Isaiah 51 reminds us that when facing fear and doubt, look to the rock from which you were hewn and the quarry from which you were digged. So my first word, you're not only deemed worthy by the degree that you will receive today, you've been called into existence by the God of freedom and faithfulness and covenant to embrace the freedom of Yahweh is to stand on free ground. It is my hope that you will listen to the rock 
that is the ground and source of your being. It is to recognize that just as your name will be called in this ceremony today, there's another voice calling your name. Listen for your name. Choose carefully what you answer to. You don't belong to the gods of nationalism, racism, classism, sexism, homophobia. You do not belong. You do not belong to the gods of enslavement, subjugation, manipulation, and control. You don't even belong to the pages of your bibliographies, to your tenure, or even to the great plans that we produce. Rather, we belong, body and soul, life and in death, to the God who sets before us the ways of life and death. My second word, listen to the rock. That reminds us that as we travel, travel light. There's a possibility that you're still holding on to a lot of baggage that can weigh you down, block your ability to find the clearing, be careful of ultimate truths, and that there is always more truths unfolding. Be careful of legalisms and doctrines which isolate, fragment, dehumanize. The call is still for a journey to become the beloved community, and the call is still unfolding. I've got to admit that in my senior years, the words of many of my systemic classes are disappearing. The lectures that I listen to are distant. And even the papers that I wrote, I try not to read anymore. <laughs> they have faded from my memory. But what has remained clear and alive in my spirit has been the relationships that were formed. The first day that I stepped on the hill, I was having a difficult time. I was trying to carry everything I owned in my two suitcases, and I was rushing to try to get it up a steep hill with all my baggage, because the taxi put me out at the bottom of the hill, and I had to get up to the top of the hill. So here I am struggling with all my baggage and everything, and then a car comes along, a tall gentleman with a very interesting dialect, stopped his car, took all my baggage, gave me the gift of a smile, a ride, and guess what? I wasn't alone. Somebody was helping me to lighten this load. At the time of the orientation, the president of Andover Newton addressed us. And guess what? It was that same tall gentleman with a very... <laughs> still with an interesting accent, who helped me to carry a heavy load and gave me a wonderful gift, a smile. I remember the professors who spoke to my heart as well as my mind. I remember the students who formed study sessions so we could all debrief what we had heard in class. I remember the commitment, Nancy, those same students made as we moved from theory to praxis, boarded buses to witness against segregation on the eastern shore of Maryland. I remember the times the whole school gathered over a meal to sing, to celebrate, and just be community. Not to analyze community to death, but just be community. I knew I was finding my way into that new community when I could travel light, drop my defenses, become vulnerable, open my heart to stand on the stage with Valerie Russell and sing Moon River. Imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> Here I am standing before all of this Caucasian audience singing Moon River. <laughs> the walk of life is not a noun. It's not a place. It's not a fixed position where you can become stuck. It's a verb. It's active. It flows with the spirit. It takes across us across all the barriers and the walls and the rails that we resurrect to fragment, isolate, and protect ourselves from one another and from God. Travel light and discover a God that will free you to see the whole humanity, to feel the heartbeat of creation in all of its wonderful manifestations, to experience the amazing gift of being used by God in ways that are beyond belief and imagination. What a mighty God we serve. 
my final word, you matter. You are shaped in the image and spirit of God, and you matter. Signs are rising everywhere I look. I see them on church lawns. I see them in Ferguson, Missouri. I see them in Baltimore, in New York, in my hometown of Norfolk, Virginia. The signs simply say, black life matters. The signs have a particular reference. They are testimony against the culture of violence as black men are dying on our streets each and every day from gun violence at the hand of those who are hired to protect them. However, for this ending word. They have a universal meaning and a divine calling. They speak to the fact that you, just as I did 50 years ago, are graduating into a world that is not yet free of racism, sexism, classism, homophobia. Too many, too many in our land are still having nightmares rather than daydreams of a wonderful good morning. And here's the truth for me. You matter. Your life matters. Your calling matters. What you choose to do or not do matters. You can choose to enter the world of the status quo, the world of privilege, power, materialism. You can be content to simply find a place for yourself with the comfortable and familiar. Or you can break ranks with all of its isms and start imagining and ushering in the world that God intends. I walked out of my graduation right into a movement and a messenger with dreams and values that have guided my life for over 50 years. My world has grown since I boarded that Greyhound bus. My community has expanded in so many ways. I came out of my box. I took a journey in the company of sisters and brothers who had a different truth than mine. Don't get me wrong. I want you to share your story and your truths and your faith as passionately as you can, but then I urge you to stop for a moment and just listen to those who may see it different because the truth is, they also matter. I've been hanging out lately with William Barber, the moral messenger from Raleigh, North Carolina, who has a moral message and is leading the moral movement, composed of people of all colors, old and young, gay and straight, rich and poor, people from all walks of life. It's a moral movement steeped in moral authority and it's changing lives and systems. So my final word is listen. Listen to the rock which offers you the ground of moral authority. There's a difference between power and moral authority. Power is the ability to control things. It's a noun, cementing things in place. Moral authority is the capacity to change things. It's a verb. It moves us beyond the noun to the not yet. Power depends upon coercion. Moral authority calls for inspiration, courage, and sacrifice. Your life matters. The calls and the seductions are gonna come from every direction and place. So what you answer to will make all the difference. So listen, listen to the rock. The rock of memory and call. You belong to God. This God will not take you into a place where God's grace won't keep you. Trust me, the journey will get bumpy at times. The storm clouds are always gathering. But God is the God of the storms of earth and sea as well as the spirit of us to address those storms. Listen to the rock. Travel light with your wings of moral authority. There are more walls to bring down and bridges to resurrect. Listen to the rock. There's a place with your name written all over it, your calling written all over it, and you're going to be able to find it when you look into your brother's face, when you look into your sister's eyes and say very simply with hope and expectation, here I am, God. Here I am, God. Find a way to use me.